Hello fellows, Mr. Creepy Creeps here. If you are new here, you can subscribe our channel. We upload daily horror videos. As an FBI agent in the elite homicide unit, I was often tasked with tracking down the worst of humankind. But one case in particular really stays with me, and to this day, still haunts my nightmares. The media called him the Vampire of Sacramento, and the name was certainly a fitting one. We found the victims with bite marks all over their bodies. They also showed signs of extensive torture, as well as mutilation both before and after death. In some cases, glasses from their kitchens had been used to collect warm blood from the dying, struggling bodies of the victims. Others had organs removed. We would eventually find out why and the reason was horrifying beyond anything I could have imagined. Agent Stone and I drove through the flat city streets as pale moonlight illuminated everything in a harsh glare. The summer heat still sizzled from the pavement. Everything felt muggy and wet, and dark storm clouds had gathered over the city. The house lay up ahead, just a flat, one-story place with no distinguishing characteristics. It was painted a dull blue and had a freshly mown lawn. It looked like it could have been copied and pasted from a hundred similar houses scattered throughout the area. But it was what was inside that distinguished this house. Police cars blocked off the street in front of the crime scene. Their lights and sirens were turned off, always an ominous sign at a crime scene. I always knew that when the police weren't rushing anymore, it meant the victims were too far gone for help. A couple of gawkers stood there as well, two teenage girls. One of them had hair dyed a bright pink with streaks of black in it. Many silver necklaces twinkled around her neck. A few cops unstrung spools of yellow crime scene tape warning people to stay off the property. An obese police officer with a face like a walrus and a large drooping mustache walked up to our black, unmarked sedan. Sorry guys he said as I rolled down the window. Roads closed. I gave him a faint smile and pulled out my federal identification card and badge. His eyes widened for a brief moment. Jesus, you FBI guys are here already. This is the second case where people have had blood drained from their bodies in this section of town, I said with venom. Of course we're here. Whenever we smell smoke, there's usually a much larger fire under the surface. If there's two separate incidents we can prove, then there may be more that we can't prove or haven't connected yet. The police officer nodded his fat face, jiggling his many chins. He smoothed his mustache contemplatively as he stared at us. Were you at the first crime scene for this unsub? Agent Stone asked the state cop. The police officer gave us a grim smile wetting his small rubbery lips. His tiny teeth glittered white, but the smile had no real mirth in it. Yes, I was there, he said coldly. He reached out his hand to me. I'm Officer Paisley. Rick to my friends, though. He gave a short bark of laughter at this, though I didn't see what was funny about it. What do you think about this guy? I asked, always curious to know what the local cops thought. Officer Paisley shrugged his rounded shoulders, reminding me of Humpty Dumpty in his general body shape. I think he's one sick SOB, Officer Paisley said blandly looking away. I saw what he did to that family over on Turtleback Lane. You know what the media calls him? The Vampire of Sacramento. Quite a nickname, huh? I remembered looking through crime scene reports of the first murder scene. It had indeed been a horrifying experience, just reading through the sterile police descriptions of the homicides and looking at the photographs. In the first crime scene, there had been a husband and a wife murdered in the kitchen, their hearts taken out of their bodies, the blood drained from them. In the living room, they found an infant in a crib. His entire chest cavity had been ripped open, as if with claws. Everything once inside his small, fragile body was strewn about the room like garbage. The tiny intestines hung from the walls of the crib, unspooled like a bloody snake. 
you know. They found the seven-year-old daughter hanging from a tree in the backyard, her eyes removed, her chest cut open down the middle. The black sockets stared sightlessly ahead. Her pale skin showed that her blood too had been drained. I wondered what nightmares awaited at us at this crime scene, now that I would get to experience it firsthand and not just through pictures and documents. Agent Stone parked the car and stared at me with his cold blue eyes. Let's go, he whispered, looking pale and uncertain. The police officer at the door waved us through the threshold. Inside, it was dark. I put on my latex gloves and tried flicking the lights, but nothing happened. Agent Stone and I pulled out our flashlights, turning them on. The white glare of the LEDs made everything seem overly saturated and unreal. The power's out, I said. My voice sounded far too loud in the dark confines of the house. The shadows pressed in on us like the walls of a coffin. Agent Stone hesitantly stumbled ahead, flashing his light to the left and right. At first, we saw nothing out of place. We had entered a dining room with a long, rectangular table and an antique grandfather clock that eerily ticked away, marking each moment of time. Where's the bodies? Agent Stone whispered, glancing around nervously. We kept going forward into a kitchen, and there we found the first of the victims. It was a woman, and she had been young and beautiful when she was murdered. Even through the layers of clotted blood and the gore that covered her body like a carpet, I could see that. She had green eyes like a cat that stared sightlessly up at the ceiling, still filled with horror, even in death. Her chest was ripped open, and a dark, ragged socket marked the spot where her heart had been. Her grisly death mask showed the incomprehensible agonies she must have gone through before the merciful release of oblivion finally took her away. Next to her stood a blender, filled with a slurry of organs and Coca-Cola. The half-empty bottle stood next to it, still fizzing quietly on the table. Other than our breathing, it was the only sound in the room, eerie and constant like the last bubbling gasps of a dying man. Everything sounded muted, almost like how sounds become muffled and distant during a snowstorm. But there was no snow here, no storms at all. What's your verdict, Harper? Agent Stone asked, his face revealing nothing as he looked at me. I think we're probably dealing with a paranoid schizophrenic, but it's odd, I said, looking at the crime scene with a sick feeling of revulsion rising in my chest. I pressed it back down, focusing on the job. From what I read of the last crime scene and from what I'm seeing here, it looks like a combination of both organized and disorganized features. There is clear evidence of planning. He picked the locks at both residences and covered the cameras with paint. Whoever he is, he's drinking the victim's blood and organs, Agent Stone said, a quick flash of disgust crossing his face before it reverted back into a stony mask. I'm thinking a white male. Between the ages of 20 and 40, I nodded. Serial killers almost always targeted victims within their own race, after all, and all the victims so far had been white. It was a comfort thing for many, I believe, though there were always exceptions like Richard Ramirez, who would kill a variety of victim types of any race or gender. The age was just pure probability, as most serial killers began their sprees around the ages of 15 to 30. There could be dozens more victims stretching back a period of years, connected to this unsub for all we knew. Agents at the FBI were looking through cold case files, trying to look for any connections to the blood drinker we now hunted. Where's the rest of the family, I asked, looking forward past the threshold leading into the kitchen where a smeared trail of blood curved down the hallway. Agent Stone just shook his head, careful not to walk on any of the blood spattering the floor and walls. In front of us, the hallway opened onto doors on both sides. I looked into the first one, seeing a little boy's room decorated with posters of cartoon characters. It was empty, however. The bed was still neatly made. It looked like the boy had just stepped out 
and would be back at any moment. The truth made my heart ache. I felt a rising sense of sickness as I thought about the fact that he would never see this room again. The next one was the master bedroom. A large bed stood in the center of the room, surrounded by mahogany cabinets and dressers. Laying across the bed, I found the dead woman's husband. He looked like Jesus on the cross, his arms spread out on both sides of him, his legs tightly coiled together. The unsub had wrapped razor wire around his wrists and ankles. This victim was naked from the waist up and had deep slash marks on his chest and neck. The slashes seemed to form some occult symbol, though I didn't recognize it immediately. The symbol looked like three upside-down triangles of ascending sizes, contained with each other at the center, followed by a circle with an eight-pointed decoration like a lotus flower around it. His eyes and eyelids were both gone, giving him a look of horror and surprise. The black sockets dribbled dark, clotted blood as they stared sightlessly up at oblivion. His mouth had been slashed from ear to ear, giving his mutilated face an insane, manic grin. What's that symbol? Agent Stone asked, sounding mesmerized. He took a step forward toward the body, but I put a steadying hand out to stop him. I've seen it before, I said, but I can't remember where. I think it was in some college class about religions years ago. The memory felt like a word on the tip of my tongue, but the connection wouldn't come. I shook my head. We'll take a picture and send it to the lab. They'll be able to look it up. Does this change your profile of the unsub? Agent Stone said, smirking slightly. I shrugged. It seems to suggest more organization than we've previously thought and perhaps some relation to occult rituals, I said. This case just gets weirder and weirder. Little did I realize that I hadn't seen anything yet. Things were about to get very strange in the next few minutes. We found the two children, a seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl, in the bathroom, their bodies intertwined like rats in a rat king in the tub. Their limbs were locked around each other in a death embrace. Rigor mortis had hardened their faces into grimaces of terror. The tub was half filled with bloody pink water. Their throats were cut from ear to ear, nearly severing their heads from the bodies. The hearts had been removed from both of their chests, leaving a dark, gaping hole of ragged bone and gore behind. God, Agent Stone gasped, looking pale and off balance. We've got to get this son of a bitch. Maybe it's more than one person, I said, thinking back to the occult symbol carved on the dead man's chest. What if we're dealing with a cult, something like the Manson family? The Manson family didn't drink blood and liquefied organs, Agent Stone spat angrily. I think what we're dealing with... He stopped speaking suddenly, his eyes widening as he looked past my head. Out the bathroom window, I glanced behind me and gasped. I saw two pale glowing eyes the color of cold moonlight. The flesh ran down in dribbles and rivulets, as if the skin were liquefying and dripping off like water. It looked like the abomination was melting under the effect of a corrosive acid. A hairless face shone white, its visage like flat, overlapping plates of bone. It had no nose, and its teeth gleamed like long silver needles. It put its long, twisted fingers to the window leaving trails of blood as its fingertips lightly stroked the glass. It grinned at us with its lipless mouth before slinking down and disappearing from view. What in the fuck was that? Agent Stone whispered, quickly backpedaling out of the bathroom and away from the window. He stepped in the smeared trail of blood. With a sticky, tacky sound, he pulled his loafer free and stumbled away. I felt stunned for a long moment, still staring out the window expecting to see the mysterious face return. But nothing stirred outside. Everything seemed deathly quiet. Wait, I cried, running after him. He stumbled toward the front door, pulling out his gun and cocking it. The semi-automatic pistol clacked with a sound like bone snapping. Agent Stone flung open the door and stepped outside, 
Taking a deep breath, I took out my gun and followed after. Here. The streetlights cast the empty sidewalks in a harsh glare. The constant tink-tink-tink of their flickering seemed like the only sound in the world at that moment, other than the fast, panicked breathing of Agent Stone and myself. Where is everyone? I whispered furtively. The police cars were still here, blocking off the road, but the police themselves were nowhere in sight. The entire street was deserted. I didn't see a single person anywhere. When I had driven up, there had been at least a couple of gawkers on the sidewalk, too. Sounds were muted and eerie. Each one of footsteps echoed up on the empty street. And yet I didn't hear a single bird or hear any crickets chirping. No mosquitoes buzzed around my head. It seemed as if we had entered some mirror world that looked identical, just without the people and animals. Hello? Agent Stone yelled. His voice reverberated back to us as if he had screamed into a cave. I grabbed his arm, shaking my head. Don't, I hissed through gritted teeth. Don't yell. I have a feeling that we're not alone. As Agent Stone's cry echoed off into the distance, I heard a new sound. Heavy footsteps, like the pounding hooves of a running deer. Someone screamed nearby on the other side of the street. I saw one of the gawkers stumble out, the girl with the pink hair. She was covered in slashes, her black clothes sliced up and wet with blood. Her eyes had rolled back in her head, the whites gleaming pale in their sockets. Her body shook, her fingers clenching and unclenching as if a seizure were ripping its way through her muscles. I realized with horror that she was floating above the sidewalk a few inches, her feet angled down, with her wide, white eyes, she looked straight at me and spoke. The melted man is coming for you, she whispered in a voice like a shadow. He's going to make you scream for death before the end. He can smell your blood, like sweet flowers in the springtime. He's coming with the power and might of the screaming goddess. Her dance will come tonight and destroy this place with her poisoned breath. The sacrifices have opened the door for worthy are the lambs. Then the girl fell hard to the ground like a puppet with its strings cut. A gunshot pierced the night from behind us. Then a high-pitched, bellowing scream followed in its wake. I spun, my heart thudding. I now knew that we weren't dealing with a regular serial killer. Officer Paisley came running up from the backyard, his fat body heaving. Rivers of sweat ran down his face. He saw me and Agent Stone and came sprinting towards us, his eyes wide and consumed by an animal panic. It's after me, he shrieked. As he got closer, I saw spatters of blood covering his face like raindrops. The deep thumping of pounding feet increased in speed and intensity. From behind the house came the creature with the dripping flesh. The one the girl had called the Melted Man. Wrapped around his body, I saw ancient rusted chains that dug deeply into his chest. They spiraled up his torso and fused into the skin. The flesh dripped over them like putrefying drops of pus. His eyes seemed to glow with a cold white light that reminded me of winter starlight. The melted man loomed over Officer Paisley, his body nine or ten feet tall. His legs crackled with the snapping of bones and the strange twisting of his many joints. Though thin and emaciated as a death camp victim, he moved with an inhuman speed. His arms looked skeletal and long, lunging out towards Officer Paisley like the branches of a tree. Holy shit, Agent Stone whispered. I saw his hand tremble, the pistol gripped tightly in his clenched fist, the knuckles white. He blinked fast, inhaled deeply and raised the gun. With a booming shout like thunder, the gun went off hitting the melted man in the torso. Black blood bubbled out from the wound. The chain slithered around his body like snakes. They unwound, loosening and tightening in rhythmic peristaltic waves. Within a few moments, the rusted spiral of chains had wrapped around the bullet wound and, almost caressingly, they covered the deep crater in his torso. The sound of the gunshot gave me a shot of adrenaline that sent me into action. 
As the melted man drew within a few feet of Officer Paisley, I aimed at his head and fired. The bullet smashed into his white, bony skull with a splash of black blood and a spattering of liquefied flesh and bone splinters. The melted man gave a wail like some ancient dinosaur, a cacophony of furious roaring. Get back, Agent Stone cried to me, his eyes wild with fear, but I was already quickly backpedaling away from the abomination. Officer Paisley was only a few paces from us when the chains on the melted man's body shot out like a spear. Officer Paisley gave a cry like a strangled rabbit as the sharp point at the end of the chains burst through his chest, a blossoming flower of blood spurting from his ruptured heart. Officer Paisley looked down, surprised, the blood bubbling and frothing over his lips. Then he fell slowly forward, and the melted man pulled his chain back. He looked over at us with his glowing eyes and grinned. The final sacrifice, he gurgled in a voice writhing with infection and sickness. The blood offering for the goddess. She comes. The melted man knelt down, his inhumanly long body twisting as he ran his fingers lovingly across the blood pooling under Officer Paisley's body. He brought it up to his bone-white face. As drops of flesh dripped off his chin, a snake-like tongue shot out and tasted the blood. He looked up at us and grinned. There was a feeling in the air like electricity, an oppressive silence hanging over the street. The sky went as dark as a midnight funeral, and the stars and the moon winked out. I looked up, seeing an enormous black shape descending from above. It was a massive female form with four arms and a human skull hanging around her neck. Her skin looked as black as a centipede's, glossy and shining. She danced as she came down, her legs kicking and arms jerking in rhythmic motions. As I watched her dance, an overwhelming feeling of dread and horror came over me. As she descended, her dance quickened, and the waves of terror rushed out from her body like ripples in a pond. I could almost see them, like a blanket of shadows fluttering out in a circle. I saw Agent Stone turn and run, blindly sprinting away. I wanted to call out to him, to tell him to wait, to not leave me alone with this thing. But I could only stare open-mouthed at the dancing goddess as she came down on the street. She stood as tall as a house, looking down at the body of Officer Paisley. My goddess, my queen, ruler of death and destruction, this is for you. The melted man hissed through his skeletal lips. The goddess looked down at the body. Her sharp, pointed talons of fingers reached down and ripped out Officer Paisley's heart from the still corpse. The ribs cracked, the flesh separating easily. Officer Paisley's eyes continued to stare sightlessly up at the black, formless sky. The goddess opened her fanged mouth. I could see swirling pools of darkness inside, silent screams echoing out from some eternity within. With a deep sigh of pleasure, she put the heart into her mouth and bit down, sending blood dripping down her face. I heard a car starting behind me. The melted man and the goddess looked in my direction with the sudden noise. Her dark eyes shone with hunger, the melted man's with insanity. A blood sacrifice, the goddess sighed, her lips splitting into a wide smile, showing off her predatory teeth. This one should suffer. The agony makes the blood taste sweeter. The melted man laughed and started toward me. I still had the pistol in my hand, but what good would it do me? I raised in a last-ditch effort to slow the abomination, knowing it was hopeless. I fired, aiming at the melted man's face as the goddess danced and twisted behind him. I felt the mortal terror emanating from her body like currents of air. I resisted the urge to simply throw down my pistol and flee blindly into the night. The bullet missed and the grinning abomination rushed at me. A car engine revved directly behind me. It roared past me, missing me by inches. The sedan slammed into the melted man, crushing his legs with the sound of shattering bones. He went flying back as the chains on his body flew out in all directions, attacking everything around him at once. They hit trees and bushes and the walls of the house with the sound of clanging metal, then vibrated in the air. 
I saw Agent Stone driving the sedan frantically motioning me inside. I jumped in the seat as the goddess soared into the air and followed after us. Fuck, he cried, accelerating as fast as the car would allow. He swerved around the writhing body of the melted man, who lay on the road, twisting his limbs like a stinging hornet. Blood the color of soot pooled under his body. The melted man slowly crawled away, pulling himself forward with his skeletal arms. The goddess flew close behind us, even as Agent Stone pushed the car up to 70 and 80 miles an hour on this residential street. I looked back, seeing only a curtain of shimmering black shadows. Her arms wrapped around the car. I felt the back of it fishtail suddenly. Drive faster! I screamed, panicked. She's... But at that moment, the back of the car lifted off the ground. We went spinning, the world flying around us in circles. I heard the crunching of metal and the shattering of glass. My vision turned black for a few moments. I felt dazed, sick, on the verge of throwing up. Waves of dread gripped my heart like skeletal hands. Off in the distance, sirens roared. Blue and red lights flashed. The goddess looked down the street, seeing the caravan of police cars and unmarked black SUVs approaching the area. With a laugh like the tearing of metal, she took off into the air. Released, finally, released on this world, she cried as she disappeared from view. The police and agents quickly surrounded us, pulling us out of the crumpled car. I was fine, just a bit shaken up and bruised. Agent Stone had a deep gash across his forehead from when he hit his head during the crash, but he was otherwise unharmed. When the police went to the crime scene, they didn't find any evidence of the melted man or the goddess there. Only a pool of black blood coagulating on the pavement showed that any of it had been real at all.